gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the co-founder and co-CEO of the Carlisle Group, David Rubenstein. So, thank you all for coming today. Uh, we have a very interesting panel to talk about innovation, and particularly innovation as it affects large companies. Before I bring the panelists out, uh, we have a couple questions we'd like you to answer on your cell phone if you have the app. And uh, what we're going to do is take your responses now, and then at the end of the panel, we're going to take your responses and see whether anybody's views were changed. Okay? So, the first question. What is the most important feature of innovative companies? So, you have the app, vote for finance and investment. Leadership from the CEO. Talent development, entrepreneurial thinking, or constant reinvention. Okay, so we have, I think, 15 seconds to vote. Everybody has an app on your cell phone. Let's see what we get. I recognize that theme. Okay. Well, as a co-CEO, I like to see that people think that CEOs have something to add value to. Okay. All right. So that's the uh, answers. Remember that, and we'll come back at the end of the panel and see whether anybody's changed their mind. So now, can I ask the panelists to come out, please? Okay. Okay. So, on my immediate left is Yusuf Albanian, who is the uh, Vice Chairman and CEO of SABIC, well-known, the largest market cap company in public company in Saudi Arabia. Andrew Liveris, who is the CEO of Dow and also the executive chair of Dow DuPont. Ken Mullis, who's the founder and CEO and chairman of Mullis and & Company. And Ralph Schlostein, who is the CEO of, of Evercore. Okay, um, why don't we start and uh, let me ask you a question. This is about innovation. And the, the, the other person we are going to have shortly, he's running a little late, is uh, Sebastian Bazan, who is the CEO of Accor. He should come a little bit later. So all of us look like, from our looking at you, that we're probably over the age of 40. Now, many people think that innovation comes from people who are in their 20s or 30s, um, and maybe, um, maybe some people in their 40s. But the most innovative ideas often seem to come from people who are starting companies who are very young. So when you're in a large company, how do you get innovative ideas to percolate up to the CEO who's often not going to be 20 or 30. So like in your company, if you might tell us, how do you get innovative ideas to percolate up or does the CEO himself come up with the innovative ideas? First of all, uh, I, I feel minority, but the good news is that you can feel home now because you outnumber the Saudis in this panel. Oh. <laughs> but but it's, I, I think yeah, but, I was really interested. But your market cap is higher than all of our market caps <laughs> together. Though. Okay. But what I, what I can see, I'm just interesting on the, in the poll, the result. I think in my view is uh, CEO has an implications on really innovations and organizations. But talent development is going to be the key elements. I'm talking about young generations, and that's why talent development, to me, it's the most crit crucial elements to uh, have innovations in the organizations. And they will push the CEOs, and they will push the organizations to perform and keep with the changes in the marketplace. Within SABIC, of course, we, we take innovations seriously because we think if we don't uh, take our proactive role to see what is exactly our customers and our market trends require in terms of what type of services and product that we are offering, I think we'll be out to perform by other, okay. other players. But do you have a way to get the ideas from your younger people to percolate up to you, or do you... Of course, we do have uh, a lot of ways in order for us to energize our, uh, our organizations. We have programs that has been in place. We call it, uh, uh, you know, uh, your ideas. What is it, your ideations process within the company? Innovation platform. We have innovations also workshop that gives everybody. We have a reward system uh, that we even uh, celebrate within our year, year end with, with the whole leadership. 
So innovation is the drive for the company, competitive positions. And okay. if we take it seriously, and we need to be embedded not only in technology, because there are corporate, they think innovation is only in technology side, but innovation in every way we do business. Hey, Andrew, how do you get the younger people's ideas to percolate up to you? And uh, Yusuf, uh, just to give you comfort, we're very large in Saudi Arabia now, so I'll consider myself half Saudi for okay. you today. <laughs> but uh, we, we look at this uh, this is the, the biggest question of them all because the half-life, half-cycle of innovation is shortening because of technology. So you've got to get culturally changed. And the bigger you are, the harder. And so complacency and calcification for large organizations sets in. So your question, if you're living in the organizational matrices that most of us grew up in in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you will die. And 15 of the top 20 chemical companies in the world died in the last 20 years. And so what we did at Dow, we're on generation 6.0 of our reinvention. When you talk to tech companies, many don't make it past generation 1.0, uh, even getting to 2.0 like Apple and Microsoft have done. So when you get to 6.0, what are the things you've got to learn? What are you going to do? Well, basically, you've got to change your complete culture. Changing culture is easy to say. It's one person at a time. So 50% of the people at Dow, now Dow DuPont, in the last five years uh, have been joining us in the last five years. We have been refreshing human talent at such a pace, and we're showing such an agility, and then we changed the organizational design. We are no longer organogram. We are, not, we are more hub and spoke, if you want to use a term. Uh, and ubiquity, especially that poll, CEO ubiquity is massive. Uh, you are the catalyst. You are the change agent. And you are, I was put into this job because I was outside in. I grew up in the provinces, so to speak. I didn't grow up in headquarters, so I was a revolutionary from within. And so by making the revolution occur, rewire the existing workforce or rehire. And then that's the mantra we've had, to change the way we can get ideas so we can get quick decision making. And short cycle innovation, I believe, the next leader of our company will have to do it even faster. The half-life is just condensing. And long cycle industries like yours and mine, we can't use the excuse that our assets define us, our physical assets. Look at the semiconductor industry, or look at the tech guys, for how quickly they have to change their assets based on Moore's law. Right. So you can do it, but it's cultural, and it really means setting the, the tone from the top. And I really do believe that Paul got it right. OK. And how do you get the young ideas percolating up to you? Well, I, I actually think you know, innovation, by its definition, has a higher probability of failure. And that's what scares, as you said, older people. They've, they've put 25 years in. When you fail at 25, who cares? Right. Um, and so I actually think the key is to give permission to your organization to fail. And, and part of that permission, I hope we put out there, most CEOs are of our age. Um, and we don't like to be perceived as failing in our own organizations. And I think that's a stifling moment. So I actually believe um, one of the things I try to do is put out my own uh, effort and, and be proud of, not proud of failing, but not hide it. The fact is the CEO, if he tries to innovate, might fail, should be open about it, should not be worried about it, and should then focus on what the organization might have learned from that experimentation. But I think in many, many organizations, the idea of the CEO being wrong sends a signal to the organization that there is no such thing as being wrong, and, and, and hence, uh, you, you know, you don't get the best out of your young, you know, uh, the whole organization because they're afraid of failure. Okay. Ralph? Yeah, well, first of all, Ken, uh, as one of your competitors, I wish you'd fail more frequently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I uh, wish I could say I'd try that, Ralph, but I hope not. <laughs> Perhaps you could try harder. <laughs> uh, I actually think it, it's, it's both, I think the CEO absolutely has to create the climate in which ideas, new ideas are welcome, where they're developed, and where failure, I agree with Ken, is permissible. Critically important, because uh, if you uh, ce celebrate, you don't celebrate failure, but you recognize that it's part of the uh, origination process, uh, you, you make it allowable within your company. But I think the, the other factor that's critically important is uh, attracting and developing and enabling super talented people. I mean, we're in a service business. We're not in long cycle investment. We're in uh, an idea where a business where we compete on the basis of our ideas. 
and our intellectual capital. Uh, and that can be found anywhere in the company, but making sure that it has the oper that it's enabled to uh, grow and to flourish uh, doesn't certainly doesn't work in a hierarchical. So when you want to send a message to your employees, do you do it through email, Facebook, some other type of social media, or what, what's the way you communicate with your employees? Has it changed over the last 10 years? or Big time. I think uh, traditional communication tools is no longer effective. I think uh, engagement is one of the corporate values that we need to develop and make it really one of our strategic communication tools. We communicate it through town hall meetings. We communicate it through, of course, our intranet, uh, through strategic town hall. And you need to engage with also your organization in a different level. And the most important elements, we even created what we call it communities, finance communities, engineer communities, and human resource communities. And we communicate with them in order for us to understand their needs and requirements. And they reflected on our strategy as well. And I, I think if you don't have really effective communications, I think even you will not be able to drive the right strategy for your company. And I'm going back to, into, into CEO influence. I think CEO has a key components on really making the company innovative. But I'm really still interested that our youth is going to be the drive and the push for our CEOs and top executives to behave differently. And I think that's the point that why I look at people developments, and engagement of people and have the right competency in your organizations, probably it's going to reshape the organization vision. Like in your organization, communication, if somebody can, can not speak English, is it a, a problem? Well, I, I think uh, it's not a problem to recruit them, but uh, you know, I have to tell you, we have been blessed by the youth in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I think they are not only speaking English, we have a lot of people even speak other languages. So to me, it's not anymore really a, a difficult part. In fact, this is part of our strength at this point. Okay. Uh, how do you communicate with your uh, employees? Well, everything Yusuf said, I won't repeat it, but maybe to add another uh, flavor to it, we went and benchmarked how all these modern companies are doing what they're doing, and we found something which uh, we were not very good at and we changed pretty last five or six years, and that's our facilities, our office facilities and our environments where we are. I mean, innovation is now occurring at intersections, and the most important intersections of them all are people intersections. So collaboration environments in your facilities. I mean, many of the buildings we had were 30, 40, 50 years old. So we've just refreshed most of our facilities around the world, whether they be R&D centers or even the corporate campus. And now, I mean, just this Monday, I did, we did a communication. It wasn't the traditional town hall. We did a game show where the topic, it was, it was our ethics, annual ethics day, where we highlight ethics and compliance around the world. And so, so we ran game shows, and I was a game show host uh, in our cafeteria. And the question and answer sessions were on ethics, and you scored points and won prizes. And then part of it also was, believe it or not, and not very good for me particularly, but a cooking class, where we actually ran a cooking class based on ingredients based on ethics, and what could be bad ingredients or good ingredients. But I'm just using that to tell you that we're stretching our mind a little bit about what are the touch points to an ADD generation, right? Because we're developing an ADD generation. And we've got to find a way to get their attention span on values and things that are non-negotiable, and then things that are very negotiable in terms of a right to fail, to your point, uh, that Ken well, made. When you redid your offices and things, do, do everybody, does everybody have an office, or do you have no. no offices? Uh, we pretty much have gone to the hoteling concept, but, but even the, let's call it the C-suite, glass, you know, where you can be, everyone can see who you're meeting with. Now, you can go to some private areas if you really need private meetings. But no, look, the, the whole thing that Silicon Valley did, I'm a big fan of, okay. which is creating people intersections. Okay, so in, in your case. Look, I think communication, there's many ways to do it, but uh, human to human is the only, is the most effective way. Look, look at around the room here. We have some of the most powerful people in the world. Uh, and, and the conference is about technology, but we did not use technology to come meet each other. Everybody flew, and I, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people here came many, many hours for the human interaction. There is nothing like face-to-face, -face, shaking hands, and reading human being to human being to getting your message across. So when you're trying to get a client to hire your firm, you can't just call them up as easily as you would like, and you have to go physically see them? 
No, it, it, it almost has never worked that way. Not only do you have, to, you have to spend time, you have to get to know them, you have to understand them. I've always asked our, I ask our, our junior associates the first time, how many of you have a doctor? How many of you think you have the best doctor in the room? I should ask everybody in the audience that. Well, it's impossible, you know, that everybody here has the best doctor in the room. But the reason you probably go to that professional is he, they listen to you, you trust them, and they understand you. Okay. You don't measure their IQ, and you can't do it by telephone either. So these are, these are interactions that you can't replace by technology. Okay, no IQ tests, right? Okay. Um, Ralph, how do you communicate? Yeah. Well, I think you, there are certain core things that drive every company, the culture, the values, the ethics, and those have to be broadly distributed uh, through broader means. I, I have found, though, that in terms of uh, communicating those regularly and effectively, the best way of doing that is in smaller groups. Uh, I found if I have a town hall meeting with a, a group this size, and I say a few words and then I ask for questions, uh, there's nothing that happens. Uh, but if I sit in a lunch with 12 or 10 uh, either younger people or partners, uh, we get a very animated uh, dialogue underway. So I'll, I'll tell, let me just tell one story. Go ahead. Uh, we interviewed someone recently to join our firm who had worked for one of the large firms and then gone to work for a client. And I asked him uh, what advice he would have for people in our business, having sat for three years uh, on the client side. Uh, and he had a number of uh, really good observations, but one of which was, if you want to have a, a, a serious, trusted discussion with a client, do it face-to-face -face and do it one-on-one. -on -one. David, if I may add yes. one, one, one point. So I think previously we used to alter our communication strategy based on the region. I mean, if you want to communicate to U.S. or Europe or China or locally, Middle East and KSA specifically, we alter our communications accordingly. But I think for the last five years specifically, we need to have one communication strategy because the youth are connected through the social media and I think everybody is think the same and demand the same. Even if you are having a business that is local or regional, you need to think that your group are really anymore, no longer local or regional, they are global. David, I, I would point out, I suspect all of us underuse Twitter as a form of communication right. with our employees. Um, you've given that advice to the President of the United States as well, I assume. Um, so uh, I leave that to the other panelists. Well, that's uh, not me. We've just been joined by Sebastian Bazan, who is the CEO of Accor, which is one of the largest hotel companies in the world, I think the largest outside the United States and China. Correct. So let me ask you a question uh, about your industry. Um, Airbnb has come along and um, disrupted, some people would say, your industry. How are you dealing with that potential disruption of your company? Well, we're dealing pretty, it's a mix. We're dealing with it pretty badly because we don't have the proper response. And we're dealing with it with eyes open because it happened to us twice already. First mutation was the online travel mm -hmm. agency, OTAs, booking, Expedia, Citrip. They today occupy almost 80% on the online travel. And they obviously we depend on them a bit, a bit too much. Then five years after sharing economy, I mean, Airbnb, Uber happened and be hitting me. And the next wave is going to be artificial intelligence. And the next wave will be online payment. All of that is impacting my industry by squeezing either my top line, people moving away from my hotels going to sharing economy, or squeezing my margin because it costs me more to do business. So what I'm saying is you need size. You need to control destination, and you need to understand that the one thing that you have that they don't have, which is a big weakness, by the way, is I have capital intensity and labor intensity. I have 4,200 hotels, which cost $100 billion to build, and I have 270,000 employees, which if you really look for the three big online companies, C3, Booking, Expedia, they were $150 billion market cap. They did not exist 15 years ago. Hilton, Marriott, Intercon, Wyndham, Choice, Accor, Hyatt, all together, it's the same $150 billion. We probably have 3 million employees, 
and they probably have 80,000 employees. Oh. So I have capital intensity, labor intensity. They don't see the client because it goes through technology platform. I actually have a warm interface. So the nature of my data is probably of a greater difference. So the next move for Accor has to be guest retention, data reinvent, and go into new businesses. And we can talk about the new businesses, but Accor is going into sharing economy. We're going into local inhabitants. A lot of things we've never done before. So life is good. So what life is good. Now, you're, you do surveys of your customers. What do your customers most want? They want quiet, cheap room, or inexpensive prices, a, a, a mini bar, or room no, service. No. What do they most want? That is, what you've talked is indispensable, but it's no longer a reason to go to any hotels. If you look, and if you talk to your clients, what they, what they want is unquantifiable. They want to be transformed. They want to live an experience. They want to remember where they've been, who they've seen, what they've learned. And the more they learn, the more they experience something unique, the more they totally forget how much it cost. So, which is why I'm telling you about what you need on top of a room is introduce those people to the Saudi culture, to the uh, Warsaw culture, and in order to do this, you need people on the ground. So Airbnb cannot do this. They're trying with the Airbnb trip, but they don't have anybody on the ground. We acquire hire every year 80,000 more people. I lose 50,000 people every year, but we open two hotels every three days. Okay. So and you're getting into the emotion, the experience transformation, which is very tough, but it's a good barrier to entry. Let me ask you, just an aside, whenever I check in a hotel, not necessarily yours, they ask for my credit card and my photo ID. Then I check out the next day, they want to see the credit card again. Why do they need it again? Well, you're going, you're going to the wrong hotel. Wrong hotel. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. It's, um, first, first, it's pretty humbling for me. I'm here at the Ritz Carlton, and we have many hotels here in Saudi. Uh, but no, seriously, <laughs> if, you go, if you go to Accor now for the last year and a half, we call that you feel that. welcome. Everything is seamless, i.e., we don't ask you for your credit card. Have that. Okay. You'll maybe maybe you're not credit worthy. I, it may be. Uh, <laughs> and and, uh, yeah. you, and uh, why do hotel companies always say they lose money on mini bars when you charge so much for those little things in there? <laughs> well, because logistic. Because you need somebody mm -hmm. to fill in to actually check how much, how many, how much you've been okay. using. But the, at the end of the day, you're never going to be charged for mini bars anymore. And you know, the next hotel we opened in Singapore last week, actually, I was in Singapore which I was scared. We have a mini bar with a very tiny items, and everything's now delivered by four robots dressed like a majordome. So you ask for a beer, you ask for, no, I shouldn't be saying that here. You ask for something, I guess you want to drink. Uh, then it is delivered by a robot knocking on your door. That is scary. I'm not sure I like I it. But. but the greatest salesman of the world is, must be the person who sells Pringles to uh, mini bars, because in every mini bar in the world they have these Pringles um, I don't know why they're so popular, but they are. Okay. Because we want you to be thirsty. Okay. All right. Thirsty. I got it. <laughs> all right. That's the reason. Okay. So, um, why, for all of you, why do you think it is the case that greatest innovations tend to come from entrepreneurs starting their own companies, and it's usually rarer for large companies to be seen as innovative as smaller companies? So, smaller companies, when Facebook got started, or when Google got started, or or an Apple was started, or Microsoft, they were very innovative. And when people think of great innovations, they usually don't think of big companies as innovators. Is that fair or unfair? It's fair. Fair. I, th I think it's uh, innovations that require the ecosystem and agility. And big corporations tend sometimes to become very slow in movement. And I think this is where most of innovations are really outside of in a small scale rather than big corporations. In fact, in SABIC, we have recognized that in order for us to achieve our innovations and technology target, we need to go aggressively and acquire technology. Uh, we, we have our own hubs and globally, but I think we should not rely heavily on our own organizations right. to come up with the technology requirements. But let me highlight one important element. I think the issue is, do you have the ecosystem for innovations? And I think in order for you to have innovation-driven enterprise, it requires those also to not only to start, but they need to be grow and scale up. And I think the successful uh, organization or country, if I may say, it requires uh, different stakeholders. It requires the entrepreneurs, which is very important. Mm -hmm. It requires also risky capital. I mean, 
financial institutions, they need to take risk. They need to dedicate some of their fund for really risky innovations. Otherwise, they will not be able to outperform the market right. return if they just go into a normal Dow or SABIC right. really a return investment. They need to go for a higher risk. Universities has really a major contributions to entrepreneurs and innovations, government regula regulations. So the ecosystem is going to be very crucial, and I do believe corporate sometimes is slow in responding to those changes. Uh, therefore, the startup is going to be very important to fuel the future innovations, really, okay. transformation. Is it? Yeah, I, look, um, I think the answer to your question is new, exciting areas. People involved in that, digitization being the current one, sell the unknown very well. Whereas corporations that have been around decades have to unsell the known. It's a big difference, makes up for your market cap point, uh, in terms of established organizations are known, and their headspace for growth is relatively known. The headspace for growth of an Amazon is unknown until they get regulated, like most of us eventually do. And so you're, you're selling the unknown, and there's a lot of positive to that. So what we've got to do is, you know, unsell what's known about us and sell what is not known about us. And for example, we've launched, I bet no one in this room could guess it, we've launched 20,000 new products in the last five years. We help you sleep better in those hotel rooms. We help you eat better. We help you actually breathe better. We help you actually manage your energy bills better. We, we don't sell like that. We sell like a chemical resin, a uh, tank car or plastic resin. So we have to undo what we did to get here right. and redo what it takes to get to the next place. And that takes the cultural change we've all talked about. And I think if you can rebrand and represent your enterprise to the modern world, you will get the value premium if you perform right. to this new technology stuff that I just talked about. Ken, in your business, um, do you rarely, do you see that the, the more innovative companies buying the less innovative ones or the less innovative ones buying the more innovative ones? <laughs> Well, there's not, there's not that much innovation uh, in the uh, world of uh, global uh, investment. Bank. It really is a human business. By the way, Dave, I was thinking about this, and, and I think... I mean, the companies Kramer, you're advising, in other words, typically when you're doing an M&A transaction, <laughs> is it the more innovative company that's typically oh, buying oh, the less mean, innovative? Clients. Okay. I would say you're having the established companies buy the innovators. The innovators um, don't really see the established companies as a place to get to. I would point out that Pringles was invented by an innovator, not the potato chip maker of record at the time. I thought you'd, you know, since you seem to be very interested. Sound like in an appreciative of, Pringle. of uh, Pringles. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, look, and I think it goes to, um, it, it goes to almost a, a capitalist argument, return on investment. You're talking about uh, executives with 20 years invested in their career track. Their return on investment on this innovation is, do I risk, you know, that amount of time I've put in to get where I am, say in the in the potato chip maker, the the innovator has a very uh, a very different uh, risk reward facing him, uh, which is I have to make this work. I have to I have to make tomorrow's idea work, um, and I do think when you look at the the companies and the clients, the 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 existing is buying the innovation, and I very rarely have we um, I'm trying to think have we seen the innovator turn around and by the, uh, the incumbent. Okay. Ralph? Yeah, I, I think it goes, uh, I think, first of all, I think it's extraordinarily difficult to get, uh, you know, disruptive uh, innovation in a staid earnings-based company. And I think a lot of it has to do uh, with our capital markets uh, globally and the expectations of investors. You take a business like Amazon, uh, which has been a phenomenal value creator. But that business went for 15 years, and even today uh, is still uh, making investments for terminal value without regard to the quarter-to-quarter -quarter, uh, earnings. Uh, Amazon should have been created by Walmart, uh, but there is no CEO of Walmart or board of Walmart that would have tolerated 15 years of very low or no return investment for the idea that there would be a half a trillion dollars of market cap uh, at the end of that uh, 15 years. So uh, sadly, I think the truly disruptive investments 
are almost always going to occur uh, in the private uh, world. And you know, the world of venture capital uh, is a world where if you have two or three great successes out of ten, uh, you have a very successful fund. Right. There are very few uh, public companies that can bat 200 or 300 uh, and maintain a very high PE. So in your industry, what would you say in the hospitality industry will be likely be the biggest innovation over the next five or 10 years? Is there something that you can tell us we're going to experience different in the hotels in the future? Well, the biggest innovation which exists today for the last four months now, it's called Google Home, uh, Amazon Echo. Microsoft is launching this new device. So you have today that device in everybody's home, probably 20% of America already, of people's home. That device will not only help you on your day-to-day -day life, how's the weather like, how's traffic like, and you're going to get your answers. But that device very quickly is meant to interrupt you without you asking anything. They're going to know whether you stress. They're going to know how you talk to your children, how you talk to your wife how she responds to you, whether you're being on the phone with your banker, if you owe him money. And all of a sudden, that device will step in and say, Sebastian, you are extremely stressed. It's Thursday. I have booked for you a hotel in Corsica. It is on sale 40% cheaper. You should go there with your children because your wife needs it as well. OK. <laughs> so, and, and since that exists, I'd better close to that device because I don't want that device to offer me or yet. It has to be at court. <laughs> So all of us, what I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you is, for me, the names, the rules of the game is changing. I had to be closer to the OTA. Maybe I should be now closer to Google, to Amazon, to Microsoft, because they may be my provider of tomorrow, which means OTA will be disrupted right. by Google. So, but what, what you just said is so correct. We, I'm, I'm extremely innovative as a person, and I wish I can do much more. But the barrier for us is whenever we want to go and dare and invest money, I'm actually being hammered by the stock market because I just cannot give proofs of actual results on money spent because I'm on a quarterly basis. Well, would I you probably, like to go private? So, we no, can... well, I wish I can go private. If, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, me, Monsieur Yassir, where are you? Let, I need actually... Uh, well, let me ask you a question uh, about hotels. Uh, let's suppose somebody gives some advice to people in the audience. Let's suppose they want to fly out they need to fly out late at night, but the, ho the plane is canceled, so they have to go to a hotel at the last minute. They don't have a reservation. They, uh, uh, you know, it's, that never happens? No, no, but it does happen quite frequently, which is good for the airport, uh, mm -hmm. airport hotels. Uh, no, no, but I'll give you a very simple example of what we do today, and I hope it's going to be an enormous success. It's called Aqua Local. You have on the planet a billion two people traveling, which is a blessing. Bear in mind, in 1950, that number was 25 million people traveling. In 1980, it was only 200 million. Multiply by six in only 35 years, and we're going to go to 2 billion. That is great news for all of us. So I have tailwinds for the travel tourism industry no matter what. Except 6 billion people do not travel on the planet. And my business has been only conducting to addressing the travelers, people coming from different cities, different countries. And I have highly paid existing asset, AAA located in the hearts of the 300 best cities in the world, and I've never addressed anything to the one billion out of the six who do not travel, who lives in urban city. And that billion will go to two billion. So there's many services I can offer to one guy who does not need a hotel room because he lives next door I to basically enhance his day life. Mike. And by doing it, you basically increase revenues, increase profit, for very little investment. My question is, though, if I know, need to check in late at night in a hotel and I go there, I don't have a reservation, and they say the room is $300 a night, and I say, well, that's more than I want to spend, does the person at the sales desk have the authority to negotiate a lower rate? Well, the answer is yes, yes, yes. And how so much? No, but no. But, uh, <laughs> no but, uh, well, you know, the answer is, the answer is extremely... You're very unfortunate no. that our... The answer uh, is very simple. Moderator has stayed in a lot of no, hotels. No, I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> and you've, you've been jipped all the time? Yes. Right. I just wondered how no, much the No, but the answer to your question is easy. The, um, ha now, the entire front desk of all the Echo Hotels have one simple tool, which is called either Booking.com or Kayak or Trivago. Okay. 
so they know per minute what is the price at which my hotel is being sold. So if you ask for the price, I'll give you the best price available on the web, because if I don't, you're gonna, many of my guests, they ask, then okay. they say, wait a minute, they go out, they use their mobile phone, they basically check, they come back, and my poor front desk guy looked like a jerk, and I don't want him to look like a fool. So we give you whatever is the best available on the web. This, and you this have is an innovation opportunities. Okay. So uh, today, uh, when you're hiring people, are you looking to hire young people that have uh, STEM education uh, backgrounds, or are you looking to hire people that have more liberal arts backgrounds, or you don't really care? Well, I, I think uh, the most important elements when you hire people, you need to look at it from different components. First of all, the competency required for your specific business. And in the same times, do they have the values and spirits and work ethics and culture that's required? These are very important elements. But I, I think th that's one part when we look at things externally, how we recruit people. But I think, in my view, the talents out there is available. How organizations are really designed internally to prepare for it. There are clearly, if we're talking about innovation today, I think clearly that you have to look at it, one from organization culture and one from sustainability strategy. If you look at three main factors that created the right environments today for innovations, you have the technology uh, push. I think it's technology push. There are so much advancement in technology that it's like, you know, uh, automations and internet penetrations and also affordable structures like broadband and so on. This is a great opportunity to leverage for innovations. You got also capital uh, bush, which basically the digital players are really pushing out, uh, you know, the pure play technology business and focus into more high-end technology. More importantly, also consumer bush, consumer pull. I'm sorry, it's providing the people right now are willing to connect and share, and develop and collaborate. These are environments for us to innovate and bring things more more appropriate. So. Uh, in my view, organizations need to be agile, they need to be prepared what type of talent they acquire, and they need to create the right environment for them to flourish. If you're going to bring them inside with the same organizations, let me, when maybe probably this is the last chance for me to, to, to operate here. The biggest mistake right now for organizations, they look at innovations through organization structures. In my view, future organization has no value. Organizations only is going to help you for your ERB process for basically accounting requirements. But you need to have agile organizations that can serve everybody to flourish and serve your objectives and share all the values. Andrew, you've been a leader in the United States in, in saying that we can do more uh, innovative manufacturing in the United States. Um, is there evidence that the United States can be a manufacturing uh, innovator in the future? Absolutely. And I'd say the last five to six years, we have reversed the trend We've redefined manufacturing so it's no longer basics industries you know, that we used to brand it as, you know, the polluting, you know, the smokestacks, all that stuff. I think advanced manufacturing is the term that's been used, but actually we've dropped the word advanced because now we've understood that factory automation, digitization of factories has arrived. The ind industry 4.0, as it's called in uh, parts of the world, you know, Klaus Schwab's book, the arrival of all of that means that we are actually now building the factories of the future. What we have not done, and in the United States, we're putting a lot of emphasis on this. And I've just been named to the uh, uh, President Trump's uh, apprenticeship workforce development program. It's a very big mismatch between the education system and the ability to get the right type of workers. And I'm not talking about the four-year degree engineers, STEM, although I can be talking about that, because I think we have a mismatch with that as well. We're graduating way too many four-year degrees that don't have real jobs that follow it. But I'm actually talking about what we, the people in the factories. The people that had a, the human machine interface is being redefined before our very eyes. The digital worker has arrived, yet our education system is not producing it. So we're having to produce it. And just let me make a plug for Saudi Arabia. I think Saudi Arabia is on the forward curve here. I think they've done a very good job, companies like Sabic and Aramco and others, in training workers of the future. Other countries have too, but I'd give a big shout out to Saudi Arabia for doing it. Uh, Ken, earlier in your career, you worked at Drexel Burnham when more or less the high yield bond was perfected and not amended. What was so innovative about it in the brief time we have? You know, I think it was just looking at finance back in that day. There was one return for everybody. There was no sense of a return for different risks. And I think uh, this was back in 1981. Uh, I think Drexel Burnham was one of the first firms to say, 
we should give people a choice. It was just giving people a choice. Pick your risk and we'll give you the ability to earn a commensurate rate of return. And that was very novel. That was innovative at the time. Ralph, you innovated and you helped to start a firm called BlackRock, which is now the largest asset manager in the world. So what was so innovative that got BlackRock to where it is? Well, interesting. We uh, started by Larry Fink, who was at First Boston. I was at Lehman. And we had one very simple idea, uh, which was that the in institutional investors to whom we were selling all these complicated securities really didn't understand completely the risks uh, that they were acquiring. And the w way we knew that is every month they would call us, the largest fixed income investors in the world, and say, could you tell us what the bond that you sold us is worth and what risk it has in it? And we figured if they didn't understand that, we could take some people and put them on the other side of the table and start a, a money manager. Okay, and you're staying at a Ritz-Carlton here, is that right? <laughs> yes, I am. So you know, what, what, what's the principal criticism you would make to the owner of Ritz-Carlton about how they could improve uh, Ritz-Carlton No here. Pringles. You, you should not have asked that. I'm sure somebody's from Ritz here. So I came here at 5 o'clock this morning. I had a shower. The water is very thin. It's not hot. And the doorknob stayed in my hand. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. So, but, but that being said, I'm sure if the CEO of, of Marriott is here, he can go to one of my hotels. The same thing could happen. Okay. Well, so. you, get to, you get to keep him, I guess. Okay. So... Thank you all. We have a final uh, panel question, or not question, but the question that we asked before. So we put that up again and see whether anybody's views change. So uh, you have a chance. You have 15 seconds to uh, vote. And again, what is the most important feature of innovative companies? Finance and investment, leadership from the CEO, talent development, entrepreneurial thinking, constant reinvention, <coughs> or you could say participation on panels. But we won't have that one. Okay, so vote, please. <laughs> okay. We went down. Well, um, I guess it is that people don't think the CEOs are as important as they thought before. Um, that is the wrong answer, so we'll have to retabulate that. Um, but okay, this is what people think. It looks like constant reinvention, which is really what we talk about. Uh, and I guess the point of constant reinvention is really what people came away with, from the panel with, thinking that you have to constantly reinvent. Thank the panelists very much. Thank you all. <laughs>